morning, everyone. We're going to get started here as we uh, move into the service. A couple of things I want to share with you just before we open up with scripture. Uh, one, just a reminder, young adults, we're having our cafe here tonight, 6.30. So a reminder about that. Um, you can talk to Morgan or Natalie about that, and they'll be able to give you some clue about what they're doing. Uh, next Sunday, next Sunday we're having our soup Sunday, so we want to invite you to just stay after the service uh, and enjoy some soup, and we'll have some rolls and that kind of stuff. Just plan to stay. It'll be a great time to connect. No agenda, just a chance to connect. Um, and so we're still looking for a couple more uh, dishes of soup. If you're able to do that and would like to bring it in just in a crock pot to keep it warm, please talk to me after the service. I'd love to be able to uh, just kind of get that nailed down before uh, the end of the week. Um, also, just if you didn't know, the NFL playoffs are happening right now. And uh, so, so we, we, we started last night. We're getting closer. But February the 12th is the Super Bowl. And so I thought what would be fun is to kind of watch the Super Bowl together and have a Super Bowl party here at the church. Um, and hopefully there will be a good, some good teams, uh, not those crummy old Eagles or anything like that, but maybe some good teams. Thankfully, Tom Brady's out. So who, we're all winners now. Uh, but uh, just we'll have it here at the church, just a chance to hang out and, and watch the Super Bowl, and uh, hopefully it'll be a good game. So want to invite you to that. Uh, we'll send out more details as we get closer, and uh, you can uh, make sure to, to tune in for that. So that'll be good. All right, those are all the announcements I have. I'm going to invite you to stand before we worship as we uh, as we hear God's word, and I just want to read from First Peter chapter two, and it's just a reminder. Um, just a reminder to come, you know, touch home base. Like so much happens through our week. We just need to be reminded all the time of who Jesus is, don't we? I mean, we're just constantly all sorts of things going on. We just need to be reminded of who Jesus is. And this is what Peter says. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. <clears throat> he never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who also judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and alive for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. We're going to be talking about sheep today and the sheep gate and what that means for us. And so as we come this morning, I just want to just give us a second just to, to pause and to take a deep breath. You made it here. You're here. Let's just be in this moment together. And then we'll open up with prayer and Aunt Angela will lead us. Father God, as we join together, whether it be in person or whether it's online, Lord, we just pause and we... We breathe in you, and we just kind of exhale out those things that have caused us stress and burden this week. We just pray that you would help us to enter into this time authentically, uh, that you would allow us to just kind of bring the things that are really weighing us down to you this morning, uh, that you would help us to worship you in spite of those things because we know that, that you care for us. And so we cast those things into your capable hands. We trust you with this time today, Lord. Lead us, guide us, help our worship team to, to enter into your presence, Lord. Help us to enter into your presence. Help us to hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name we pray these things together. Amen. Take it Amen. away. Amen. Excited to worship with you today.
loves us so much. We're going to pull out an old one out this morning because it's fun to sing. And it also talks about just, you know, we want God to use us here in Hampton and in our own communities to spread his kingdom. for a second. <laughs> when I was thinking about this service a few weeks ago, um, I clued into the fact, and I'm sure God prompted me, that this is also coming up exam week for our high school students. Um, and of course, we always want to be a church that's praying for our youth and our students in our congregation, but I think there's something really special when our students can hear us praying for them. 
I don't know if you've ever had someone pray for you directly, but it's really powerful. And so what I wanted to do, it's a little different than what we normally do in our services, so I, this might be a little uncomfortable for people, uh, but I want us to just take a minute, and I want us to pray for the students and the youth, both who attend this church, but also those in our community as well. Um, I mean, I have three close to teenagers, so this is pretty close to my heart, and they, the conversations I have with them would never have happened when I was in middle school and high school, or junior high, as they like to tease me and call me old. Um, they're just dealing with so many more complex issues than I remember. I remember, like, seriously, weren't, like, the popularity, the click, that kind of thing. That was the big thing, and that's no longer the big thing. Um, and so, yeah, I would love for a few people to um, be brave enough to, to pray out loud for our students. Uh, I'll close us. If you're watching online, you can also take this minute to, to pray for our students and our youth as well. Um, yeah, and just as I was reading this week, I did want to share one verse that God kind of like pulled off the page as I was reading in Isaiah, and I wanted to um, just share this here, especially with any of our students that are that are sitting here, I just, I want you to know this so deeply. It says, he will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. All right, let's take a minute to pray.
thank you for the gift of youth and the passion and the fire that they bring to everything that they do. God, I pray that you would stir up that passion to be for you, for your kingdom. God, I pray that you would draw their hearts so close to you um, that they would know you and that would give them the confidence and the encouragement that they need to, to follow hard after you. Um, God, we want you to win their hearts, uh, not just their minds or not just their you know kind of mental ascent, but God, we want you to just be so real to them you will be with them in every conversation that they have, in every relationship drama that they might be going through. Um, just, God, give them wisdom, give them discernment, and especially give them comfort and courage. Just... Thanks, everybody. I'd like to almost sing this song. This is the first song that I kind of chose this week. Uh, it's 20 years old, showing my age. Um, but really, like, this is my prayer for our youth. God would just come over them. So let's pray this together. Stand up and sing. Consuming
sing the summary of all that we believe um, to be true.
Thanks, Angela, for leading us. Thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, we're going to start off this morning with a little Canadian history lesson. I want to show you a picture, and you can tell me what it is. Go ahead. Anytime. Right now. There we go. What's that? The Vimy Ridge Monument. That's exactly right. This is a, this is a monument that's located in, in Vimy, France, um, and it commemorated probably one of the most important battles in Canadian history. Uh, in World War I, it was a particularly bloody battle, um, and it was also one of these battles that, that kind of solidified Canada as uh, a country in the eyes of you know, the world, but also within its heart. It had always just been a, a commonwealth state, and then all of a sudden it's its own nation, and, and now it, it kind of stood on its own in this particular battle because it was able to take uh, Vimy Ridge when a lot of other uh, battalions had failed. These Canadian soldiers had taken them, but it took a huge cost. Like, it, it was, it, like I said, it was a very bloody battle, and, and what you can see on the monument as you get closer is inscribed on the monument itself are the names and the ranks of 11,000 plus, so just over a little, over 11,000 Canadian soldiers who were never found, who were lost, uh, died in battle, but their bodies were never recovered. And you can see they have a, a cemetery. This is the Commonwealth Cemetery, but it includes Canadians as well. Just there, That's just one of, of multiple cemeteries that are there as well, just all these, all these people who had died at, at Vimy Ridge. And this monument is a, is a, a tribute. It's a, it's a way of, of reminding us of, of what they had accomplished. But we, you can't look at something like that. You can't, and I've never been there myself, but I, but I understand that when people go there, it is a, it is a moving experience. And I can, I can appreciate that, and I can understand that. And you might, you might be able to appreciate that, what, that as well if you have someone that, that is near and dear to you that has passed away, and you go to their graveside, right? You, you, you see this name inscribed on a rock, but you can't help but be moved by that name. Well, today, we're going to look at a passage that is very much a monument, that serves in the same kind of capacity uh, towards honoring people who have, who have gone and, and done something amazing and have accomplished a lot. And, and it's in Nehemiah chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, I need to give you a warning before we go into Nehemiah chapter 3, because Nehemiah chapter 3 is one of those passages that if it's in your Bible reading plan like that read through the Bible in a year kind of passage, if depending on your personality, one of two things might happen. The first thing would be, oh, great. Look at all these names and places that I have to read. And you're like, oh. Some of us are like, oh, this is great, because it means I can just skim right through it, and I'm done for the day, <laughs> right? So depending on your personality, that's, that's this kind of passage. It, it, it's really, it's, it's really hard. Because it's names that we can't pronounce, and I'm going to butcher them here today, but I'll give it a shot. And it's places that we don't even know where they are. And so this passage can be really, one of those passages where you're like, why is this even in here? What does this do? What is this accomplishing? And we're going to talk about what it does here in a second, but let's, let's, let's endeavor to try and read chapter 3 and see how we do. All right? <clears throat> you can follow along here and make fun of the way I say names. All right. Then Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the Sheep Gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and the Tower of Hanel. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zakur, son of Imri. The fish gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. Hassana. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Merimoth, son of Uriah, and grandson of Hakaz, repaired the next section of wall. Beside him were Meshulam, son of Berechiah, and grandson of Meshezebel. And then Zadok, son of Bena, next were the people from Tekoa, though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. 
The old city gate was repaired by Joadiah, son of Paseah, and Meshulam, son of Besadeah. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Next to them were Metaliah from Gibeon, Jadon from Maranoth, people from Gibeon and people from Mitzpah, the headquarters of the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River. Next was Uziel, son of Herahiah, a goldsmith by trade, who was also worked on the wall. Beyond him was Hananiah, a manufacturer of perfumes. They left out a section of Jerusalem as they built the broad wall. Rephaiah, son of Hur, the leader of half the district of Jerusalem, was next to them on the wall. Next, Jediah, son of Harumoth, Harumoth, repaired the wall across from his own house. And next to him was Hattush, son of Hashbaniah. Then came Melchijah, son of Haram, and Hashab, son of Pahath Moab, who repaired another section of the wall and the tower of the ovens. Shulam, son of Halohesh, and his daughters repaired the next section. He was the leader of the other half of the district of Jerusalem. The valley gate was repaired by the people from Zenoa, led by Hanan. They set up its doors and installed its bolts and bars. They also repaired the 1,500 feet of the wall of the dung gate. They must have got the short straw to do that job. The dung gate was repaired by Melchijah, son of Rechab, the leader of Beth Hakarem district. He rebuilt it, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. The fountain gate was repaired by Shulam, son of Kolha. Oh, this is a bad one. Kolhaze, Kol Kolhaza. That's it. Kolhaza, the leader of the Mitzpah district. He rebuilt it, roofed it, and set up its doors and installed its bolts and bars. Then he repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam near the king's garden, and he rebuilt the wall as far as the stairs that descended from the city of David. Next to him was Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, the leader of half the district of Beth Zur. He rebuilt the wall from a place across from the tombs of David's family, as far as the water reservoir and the house of the warriors. Next to him, repairs were made by a group of Levites working under the supervision of Rehum, son of Bani. Then came Hash, Hashabiah, the leader of half the district of Kila who supervised the building of the wall on behalf of his own district. Next down the line were his countrymen, led by Benui, son of Henadad, the leader of the other half of the district of Kila. Next to them, Ezer, son of Jeshua, the leader of Mitzpah, repaired another section of wall across from the ascent of the armory near the angle in the wall. Next to him was Baruch, son of Zabai, who zealously repaired an additional section from the angle to the door of the house of Elashib, the, the, the high priest. Merimoth, son of Uriah, the grandson of Hakaz, rebuilt another section of the wall extending from the door of Eliashib's house to the end of the house. The next repairs were made by the priest from the surrounding region. After them, Benjamin and Hashab repaired the section across from their house, and Azariah, son of Messiah, and grandson of Ananiah, repaired the section across from his house. Next was Binui, son of Henadad, who rebuilt another section of the wall from Azariah's house to the angle and the corner. Palal, son of Uzziah, carried on the work from a point opposite the angle and the tower that projects up from the king's upper house beside the court of the guard. Next to him were Padiah, son of Parash, with the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel, who repaired the wall as far as a point across from the water gate to the east and the, and the projecting tower. Then came the people of Tekoa, who repaired another section across from the great projecting tower and over the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired the wall. Each one repaired the section immediately across from his own house. Next, Zadok, son of Immer, also rebuilt the wall across from his own house. And beyond him was Shemaiah, son of she she Shechaniah, the gatekeeper of the east gate. Next, Hananiah, son of... Oh, man, this is a good one. Sh Shelemiah and Hanan, the, ne the sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. While Meshulam, son of Berechiah, rebuilt the wall across from where he lived. Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the wall as far as the housing of the temple servants and merchants across from the inspection gate. Then he continued as far as the upper room at the corner. The other goldsmiths and merchants repaired the wall from that corner to the sheep gate. And we have gone all the way around Jerusalem and read all those names. So I'm going to take a drink of water for a sec here. 
So you can see, you can see, like, what does this have to do with anything, right? Like, I mean, that's the, the difficulty of this passage, but there are some really important things for us to see. And if you remember, they're at the point, like, last week we talked about how Nehemiah had done some scouting, he had looked at the project, he brought people in, uh, and kind of raise them up to work towards this one goal. And, and now they're starting the work. The work is actually beginning. And the first thing that I want you to notice about this is that there is a, a level of unity that we don't see very much around us anymore. Unity is all over chapter 3. Let me just give you a second. It's almost, it's almost annoying how many times the phrase next to him or beside him, or near him, happens in this one little chapter, all right? So just to give you an an example, let me just read the ones that I I quickly outlined. Verse 2, next to them. Verse 5, beside him. Verse 7, next to them. Verse 8, beyond him. Verse 9, was next to them. And verse 10, next to him. Flip over to the next one, verse 16, next to him. Verse 17, next to him. Verse 18, next down the line. Verse 19, next to him. Verse 20, next to him. Verse 22, after him. Verse 25, next to him. It's almost annoying how many times you see this. But it highlights this idea of God's people working shoulder to shoulder. And and really what Nehemiah does is it just takes us clockwise around the walls of Jerusalem. And it shows all these different people working together to accomplish this one shared task. But what it does the most, and what I want you to see, is not only does this paint a picture of people building a wall, but it paints a picture of God's people with a shared goal that only can happen through God's provision. It's a living picture of the church, really. Remember, we've been talking about this all throughout this series, is that there are things about Nehemiah that that don't just talk about what happened in a historical moment, but help us to see this living picture of the church. They lived in unity, shoulder to shoulder. They, they did what, what we could never do on our own. They were part of something bigger than themselves. They were part of something that, that brought them along together and, and unified them. And the same thing is true for our church, ladies and gentlemen. We can't do what Christ has called us to do on our own. We can't go off on our own little offshoots and try and and build something and expect it to to take off. We don't have the energy or the the resources to be able to do what Christ has called us to build his kingdom, what we sang about today. We don't have the resources or the ability to do it apart from Christ. And here we have this, this people of God working together with God's provision for them. So there's... There's unity in this passage. But there's also diversity. And what's beautiful about this is is chapter 3 is really a mosaic of people. It's a mosaic of people who have have different educations, different backgrounds, different social statuses, even even different geographic regions that they've come from. You've got Levites and priests. Those are people you would expect to be there. But then you also have rulers. You know, these are people who are heads of districts that are getting their hands dirty, building this wall. But then you also have these people mentioned in in, in verse 8 where it says, Uziel, son of Herahiah, one of the goldsmiths, a goldsmith is involved, repaired the next section. And beside him was a perfume maker. So these are not guys that would normally be, you know, working with, you know, rocks and chisels and all that kind of stuff that they would need to to do to build this wall. But there they are rebuilding this wall. And then I love this passage, verse 12 Shalom, who is ruler over half the district of Jerusalem, and he works alongside of his daughters. I love that. I love that. Then you also have guys who, who have a checkered past. You wouldn't know this, but in, in, in certain passages in chapter 4, um, or in verse 4, sorry, there's Melchijah. And Melchijah had, had, in the book of Ezra, had kind of walked away from in, in direct disobedience to what God had said about, 
about who they should marry and, and, and staying away from bringing in foreign idols into Jerusalem. And they, and they had chosen to, to disobey that. And, but here we see them restored by God's grace, working shoulder to shoulder with the rest of God's people. Men, women, young, old, rich, poor, religious leaders, lay people, those with a checkered past, all working together. Does that, des- does that describe something? Does that maybe hint at something for you, maybe? That, that's a picture of the church. That's what the church is to look like. This beautiful mosaic that is called the church. Add on to that, what I think is even more, more impactful is that Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls. So he's not getting new rock cut. He's using the old, the, the burnt, the broken, the disassembled kind of rock and reusing it again to rebuild the walls. And isn't that, isn't that what Jesus does with the church? He uses you and I who are burnt out, who are bruised, who are broken, and he uses us to build his kingdom. That is such a beautiful, beautiful picture. That's, that's chapter 3. The next part is humility. It shows us humility. Everybody got their hands dirty. You have the high priest. You have leaders. You have perfume makers. You have goldsmiths, like I mentioned before. All of these people hanging doors, putting in bolts, I, I'm sure like, there must be moments where, where, where people are coming alongside of others who don't know exactly what they're doing, and they're like, this is probably the best way to hang a gate and shows them how to do it, or maybe like this end of the hammer works better, like use this end of the hammer. You know, those, I, I'm assuming there are those kinds of conversations when you're bringing in this vast amount of different people. But there's such humility as they work together. There isn't egos involved. There's a willingness to look out for others. You'll notice in passages like verse 10 and verse 29 where they have names of people who not only did repairs to their own home, but then they went across opposite to them and, and worked on other people's homes. That's a picture of the church because in in Philippians, it tells us to not just look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Others. We are not to just kind of take care of our own. We are to look to the interests of others. So they demonstrated humility. But then they also, there's, there's one little bummer verse in this verse, or in this chapter. Did, did you pick it up when I was reading it? There's one little section in verse 5. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. These nobles of Tekoa were too proud to do the work. They were too proud to be involved. This kind of manual labor was simply beneath them. And what pride does is it kind of amps up our own self-importance. It makes us kind of think that we're more of a big shot than we actually are. And it works against us becoming like Jesus. It pushes back against this this Christ-likeness that needs to be developed within the heart of every believer. Because if you look at the life of Jesus, who was the most noble of all noblemen, do you remember the scene where at the very end of, of his life, he takes He takes off his robe and he does the most menial task possible and washes his disciples' feet. This gross, humiliating job. And then he says to his disciples, go and do the same. We are to demonstrate humility. We are to be ones who serve others. That means that for us as a church, that no job is is too small when it's done for Christ. No job is too menial when it's done to worship and serve Jesus. That also means that there is no job too big and too overwhelming that we can't tackle with God going before us. 
It also reminds us that, that there is no list of priorities when it comes to spiritual gifting. There is no more desirable gifts. There's no room in, in the church, in this church or any other Christ-following church for a, a comparison of gifts. Oh, well, he's got the gift of whatever, and I wish I had that one. There's no room for that because every gift is important. And we need to be humble about it. There is no unimportant ministry. But then, and this is kind of where I want to just camp out for a little bit, is you start to see their priorities. You see their priorities. And we see this in verse 1. We're just going to read half of the verse. Then Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors. Now that seems totally random, doesn't it? Why would they start at the sheep gate of all the gates? They have great little names, dung gate, beautiful gate, sheep gate. What's the deal with the sheep gate? Why would they start there? The high priest of all people. One, it shows he's getting his hands dirty. He's building this, rebuilding this gate. And, but what's, what's the meaning of this? Well, it helps us to understand what the sheep gate does. The sheep gate, you can probably picture this. It doesn't, it's not brain surgery. Was the gate in which the sheep would come in and go to the temple to be slaughtered. For sacrifice. The sheep gate was the gate that was closest to the temple. And so what they did by establishing this, the sheep gate, and, and don't miss that the fact that they dedicated it, so everyone was around for this dedication. Everyone was there for this moment. They were saying, this is our priority, that we need to have this sheep gate and everything else goes around that so that we can draw closer to God through the temple. So that men and women can draw close to God through the sacrifice of these sheep at the temple. Through their blood that we might be able to receive forgiveness. That for them was the biggest priority out of all of their building projects. This was the one to make sure that they were able to draw, men and women were able to draw close to the God through the temple. And f- experience forgiveness of sins through the shedding of blood of these, of these sheep. Ladies and gentlemen, can you not see... The same principle is true for us. That needs to be our priority. We need the sheep gate. We cannot build anything until we realize that the main focus of the church, of this church, is to help people see and draw near to God. And discover and be reminded of the forgiveness of sins that they have through the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. That's our priority. We talk about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. That's not just cute words. That's the mission of the church to help people see their need for Jesus. But then they talk about their reward. The reward. You could say their reward for all the hard work they did was a job well done. You know, just like when you're mowing the lawn and you see all those straight lines, I think mowing your lawn is overrated myself. Or you could say that the reward was working together in unity. That was the big reward. But I think there's a greater reward. The greater reward, I think, is that their names are recorded in this book. The Bible tells us that heaven and earth will fade away, but the words in this book will never fade away. Their names are counted in this book. What a reward. That points us to another reward, though. A reward mentioned in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. 
where Jesus says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. A reward, a heavenly reward. A scholar said this about Nehemiah, and I think it strikes true, and it says, it is a magnificent thing when a Christian believer can leave something behind in this world, which testifies to God's goodness in human life. Those who die in the Lord will have this indescribable joy. Their earthly deeds, which have exalted Christ and enriched others, will follow them. They will be effective on earth and unforgotten in heaven. And infinitely superior to Nehemiah's project, their building work is indestructible. I love that picture. It's really what Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven where neither... Rust or moth will destroy. Seeking God's kingdom first, that's the reward. We share something with the people from, Je- from Nehemiah chapter 3, and that is our name is written in a book as well. In Revelation 3 verse 5, it says, All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. Those who choose to follow Jesus have their names written in the book. You want your name written in this book. And Jesus embraces you and says, they are mine. They are mine. How does your name get written in the book of life? You enter through the sheep's gate. You enter through and the, and the gate is, is not a where, but it's a, it's a who, right? Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 9, Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. It's everything. Everything starts with the sheep gate. Because all of kingdom work is meant to be built in on drawing men and women to God through Jesus, who is the sheep gate. And what, it's, it's kind of sad, I'm sorry for those of you who are animal lovers, but what, what happens to the sheep who go through that sheep gate? They die. They're slaughtered. But we have, we have a shepherd, a good shepherd, who says to us, the sheep, No. You don't have to go through the sheep gate. I'll, I'll do it for you. Not only will I be the shepherd, but I'll also lay down my life for my sheep. That's why, that's why they began at the sheep gate. And that's why if we skip over chapters like chapter 3, man, we're missing a lot. Let me kind of land this plane by just giving you a couple of takeaways. A couple of things to be thinking about. For those of you who are writing math exams, you probably remember this irritating phrase that your teacher would say to you, when you're doing your exercises, always show your work. Right, yeah, that's right. You can hear the moans. Always show your work. It isn't enough just to have this mental ascent. It's not enough to be able to, to just you know, kind of understand the question to show the work. And we've talked in Nehemiah about how they had spent so much time praying that prayer preceded action. But there came a point when they needed to act. And what do they do? They act. They actually step forward and they do the job. They get the work done. What binds us together is not just our belief in Jesus and and the Holy Spirit, but the work that Jesus has called us to do in the Great Commission, to go and to be witnesses, to go and to make disciples. The work is what binds us together. The work is what calls us from this, this beautiful mosaic to all start rowing in the same direction. It is the work that, that, that demonstrates to the world around us that, that Jesus has changed our life. The mission of the church is is 
to point people to Christ. That's the work. Not to earn God's love, not to, not to earn our way into the book of life, but to show that our lives have been changed by Jesus. So, show your work. The second thing is, is a question that I find more important the older I get. And that is, what are you building? Like, what are you building with your life? In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how we need to be careful what we build. Not in a physical sense. Not like some of us build great things. But what are we building with our lives? What do our lives represent? Because what's going to happen at the end of all things, all that is going to be revealed. What we have put our hand to, what, we, what our heart's desire has been, what our passion has been, what our true love has been is going to be revealed. And it's either going to be consumed by fire or it's going to stand the test of time. So what, what are you building your life on? What's, your, what's the thing you live for? What is your foundation? In other ways, to say it is, what matters most to you? Are you storing up treasures in heaven? Is your name written in the book of life? Are you investing in something that will last? These are all questions we should be asking ourselves. And our lives should be reflecting that answer. If you don't know the answer, look at your schedule. Look at what you spend your time thinking about. Look at how you invest your time. What, what are you building? I want, I want to build something that's going to last. I want to build something that's beyond me. That when I'm dead and gone, people are still going to be talking about what I put my hand to. And that's pointing people to Jesus. As we wrap up, I don't know if you will ever get to Vimy Ridge. I'm not sure I will. I'm not sure you'll ever get a chance to run your fingers along those names that are etched in the stone or see all those different gravestones and markers that are put in the rock. But I want you to be reminded and encouraged today that if, you, if you're a follower of Jesus and he's your savior, your name is etched in eternity. In eternity. Let me pray. Father God, I just pray that you would remind us again. Remind us again of your love. Remind us again of your sacrifice. Remind us again of your presence. Remind us that we can, we can spend our lives just chasing stuff that, that doesn't even matter in the long run. Lord, help us to remember that, that you are the one thing that satisfies. And Lord, we confess there are times when we, we start chasing other things that we think are going to satisfy us more. Things that we think are, are better ideas than what you've laid out in your word. Help us to get back on track. Help us to walk back on the path and trust you once again. Lord, just thank you for the church. Thank you for all these people who make up Ember Tide. Thank you for their gifts. Thank you for their, their willingness to serve and give. Just pray, God, that you would remind us that those sacrifices, that, that time given, that that investment is not just in something temporal, Lord, but it's in something eternal. Help us to walk in light of that this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I invite you to stay and have a little discussion time if you'd like. If not, have a great week, and we will see you all next week.